And thanks, Jess. Oh, it's been fun already this morning, hasn't it? I'm not going to go super long. Everyone say amen. amen. <laughs> this morning, I woke up, right? I was really chirpy after a good sleep. Did anyone get a good sleep last night? Hey? Right? So I was driving here super happy, and I wanted to talk to somebody, but nobody else was awake yet, so I talked to Siri. Does anyone else talk to Siri? And she really took a bit of the wind out of my sails. This is what happened in the car on the way to church. Ready? Listen. Hey, Siri. Oh, she better listen. <laughs> hey, Siri. What's up? Is today going to be a good day? No, probably not so nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said to me in the car. But then I realised she was talking about the weather later. I'm like, oh, she's getting smarter every day. So today is going to be nice. So then to cheer myself up, I went to the shops and bought a little present. Before I show you the present, who believes that chocolate mint is the best of all chocolates? You do. Jody, that's because you're one of the greatest humans on the planet. You get a chopped mint. I'll share it with you. No, no, that's my daughter. Don't give her chocolate. I don't care. No, don't. No, she's all right. She gets plenty of chocolate. Right? Which made me think far out. Easter's coming already. Hey? All the Westies are going to get eggs and paint them up and give them to each other like they do in Sydney, and the rest of us will exchange actual chocolate. It'll be good. <laughs> why Ben was so funny. Western Sydney is where you get stabbed before you get on the train. <laughs> Pretty good first communion, by the way, anyone reckon? I thought he nailed that. What we're going to do today, we're going to keep going in the book of Romans. Okay? The passage we get up to today is possibly one of the most um, under-preached passages and most misunderstood passages in the book of Romans. And I was going to keep you on the hook and give you the application at the end. We like to do that as preachers. We like to kind of keep you guessing, guessing, guessing. They go, ha, oh, that's what's coming at the end. I want to tell you what's coming at the end. Dom, if you could please go to the last slide. This is where we end up today. The very, very last one. It says, you, therefore. Okay, so we're talking about you as in collective us. You, singular, and you, plural. Everybody here, are you a you? Okay, so this is you. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on somebody else. For at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Oh, Dave, that's a bit heavy for 9.30, aren't we just hanging out? Not today. See, what we're talking about here is the, the, the way the gospel is appropriated. Ben nailed that communion when he said, basically, we're all cooked. And I came up with a few, during that, just a few titles for this sermon. Number one, we are cooked. But Jesus came to uncook us. Right? When, last week, Jeff said, we're all stuffed. But Jesus came to unstuff us. I was going to call it, um, unfortunately... Fortunately, have you ever played that game? Yeah. Do you guys know this game? We play it at home. Basically, someone makes a statement, and then the next person in line has to say, so basically someone says, I got a dog for Christmas. Unfortunately, it only had three legs, right? Fortunately, they were very strong legs, right? Unfortunately, we couldn't buy him a jacket. Fortunately, Nana can knit jackets. Unfortunately, she didn't have any wool. You know, and it goes around in a circle. Well. Unfortunately, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, and that we're about to go through a list that leaves none of us out. What this list does in Romans is it tempts us to be like, oh, he's talking about them. But you know that old saying, when you're pointing that way, you've got three pointing back at you. What this is trying to kind of trick you into believing is that you're fine, and then you get to chapter 2, verse 1, and it says, you therefore don't pass judgment on everyone else because you're exactly the same. And one of the things we've got to watch in Christianity, it, I, I actually think that Christians get a worse rap for being more judgmental than they actually are. Yeah. But we do have to watch, and I think this passage is written towards those within the church that we think need to do better. And that we kind of expect more from, but we're all on a journey, right? And some of us are further along, some of us are new, and so this passage is basically talking about how the gospel works in practicality. Oh, I love it. It's a hectic passage, lots of heavy concepts, but Jesus wins in the end. So let's start at the start. If you've got your Bible open, it's going to be handy bringing it every week. Because what we do as we go through Romans, we're going to make last week's application this week's introduction. 
So we seek through the book. So Jess finished last week on saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Mm. And remember how she said that, you know, that declaration meant there'd be a temptation to be ashamed, right? So he pulls living in the culture where it's like, man, if I stand on this, there's going to be times where I'm going to have to have boldness and faith and I'm going to have to rise up and be courageous. I've got to not be ashamed of this gospel. Because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, including you. So you're the you that we talk about later who's done things that have separated you from God, but you're also the you who can believe and be set free. First to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. Remember how the message first was of the Jewish people and then the Gentiles were grafted in. Okay, picture a plant. The plant's growing and then they're like, okay, we're getting the Gentiles, let's graft them in too. And if there's any gardeners in the place, after a little while, once you've grafted in a plant, you can't kind of see where the plant started and the grafting begins. Right? So the, the Gentiles are grafted in. For the gospel is the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. Okay? From first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So that's how Paul leaves it last week. Then he says this. Boy, he gets heavy. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and weakness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. A couple of key words in there. Okay, suppression of truth. We're going to start looking at a bit of a doctrine of general revelation, which is this idea that God's truth, God's presence, God's reality has been reve revealed to all people. That there's something like a God spark in every person that is drawing them to God, that is calling them unto themselves, unto himself. That every human, whether they'll acknowledge it or not, and some people would stand and fight you on this very idea. There's no way I'm being drawn towards God. They stand against that. Yeah. But the truth of the Bible says that it's actually our choice to suppress this truth with our wickedness. Right? So since what, was, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible, invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Wow. Hey, how's that? So, like, his eternal nature is being revealed to all. Yeah. You know, his invisible qualities. When you're laying on a mountain and looking up and there's no light pollution and the billions of stars and planets light up and you're like, oh, what? There's got to be something bigger than me. Or you've never even heard the gospel. You're in an ancient tribe somewhere, and they still exist today. And, and there's just something in your heart, a conscience, something where it's like, there's got to be more than this. Surely this can't be the, the entirety of existence. Well, that's what general revelation is. It's this idea that God is revealing himself daily to us, to all humanity. And it is our choice, in a way, to walk away from it. We're not able to be excused. We can't say, well, I didn't, I didn't really know God. Well, we, we all have something within us that he's been revealing. Check out verse 21. For they, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. Okay, so this concept of God, okay, so that exists, but then the decision to actually put him as God instead of just a plethora of other beliefs, it, it wasn't reality for these people. Right? To the Romans. So they neither glorified God or gave thanks to him, and their thinking became futile, and their, fool their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. One of, one of the things when we have the revelation of God and we don't obey or follow that is that we start worshipping created things instead of the creator himself. Yeah. It's like driving into the car yard with a Porsche. Honestly, this is the best analogy I've come up with. One of those really cool Porsches, not like a pretentious one, just like a cool one. Driving in and then swapping it for an old V-dub that's barely walking and you know barely crawling and driving away going, that was a good exchange. You know, you exchange the glory for something lesser. And that's what it's like when we worship things that aren't God. We're just worshipping what he already created. And it's a subpar thing to worship. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so we choose to, like, go after things. Like, look, 
Ben brought it back to our culture. We, we, we choose to go after things like homes. Now, I'm glad you've got a home. The Bible says that he will provide shelter for those who seek first the kingdom. We need somewhere to live, right? But to them, worship them like their palaces and that they somehow give us some identity? Yeah. Well, that's just them worshipping something that is subpar to God. Yeah. Why would you worship the home instead of the home giver? Yeah. You know, why, would you, why would you worship anything created except God? And, and, and it's easy to look at the Romans and go, <laughs> back to that. But we do it all the time. Yeah. True. Therefore, now what do we say when there's a therefore? Verse 24. What do we say? What's it there for? Look at you literary geniuses, okay? So we consider what's already been said. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires. This is how it works. God has revealed himself to all humanity, and then should we choose to follow a path that doesn't want to give him glory, he'll give us over to that. He'll say, go then. If that's what you think is going to bring you happiness, go. I'm not going to strangle you into my presence. I'm not going to trap you in a cage so you'll be a Christian. I'm going to let you be. And this is actually what happens whenever any of us choose to live a life separated from God. He lets us. And then we go down a path and we'll see the path soon. And essentially punch ourselves in the face and get mad at God that it hurts. He gives us over to this. What's our choice? I honestly, if you are in a place where you've been walking away from God and it's painful, but you've done it to yourself, it's really hard to pray with sincerity for that. I believe God wants to show you, you know, grace and he will set you free, but just stop, just stop doing it to yourself. I don't want you to hurt yourself. And I love you like this much. How much does God love you? He doesn't want you to hurt yourself. So he gives us over the desires of our hearts. This is what he said to the Romans, to sexual impurity to the degrading of their bodies with one another, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Hey, once again, he says the same thing again. They've exchanged, they've ripped themselves off. Instead of worshipping God, they've worshipped what God made, including our bodies. Right, these guys were... You know, they had a particular and insatiable appetite for sex, which was then and still is now a created thing. And so they worshipped that instead of God and put that above God. And and indulgence and living lavishly and and, and satisfying self became more important. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over. Do you reckon he's trying to make a point? It says it three times in this passage. God gave them over to their shameful lusts, it says. Okay? Now, even their women exchanged natural sexual relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received themselves uh, in themselves the due penalty for their error. Right? Now, often when we avoid passages like this, and I've been guilty of it, man, no one wants to preach passages when you start getting to yeah. verse 26, unless you realise that it is in the context of you. Not just you, not just one of you, us. Right? This is what happens when the people of God walk away, is, is we can walk into anything. Yeah. Right? Now, the reason in this passage that there's a specific influence... Uh, emphasis on homosexuality and women exchanging relationships with men for other women is because contextually, who is he speaking to? Jews and Gentiles, right? Now, what happened in Jewish history in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The the, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people who had been exiled and had come back to be part of the church again, had lived in a way where their history had this, this wound, this event that happened that was fresh in their minds. And so Paul's simply addressing this. What he is not doing is elevating this above the rest. He's not making specific mention of these guys in any other way than the rest of the sins that we're going to list soon. Okay, And see, as a church, we've got to get this right. Not just our church, the church. Okay, because think about this, okay? So 
let's be honest, in the history of Christianity, we've picked on certain things we would consider to be worse than others and made a point of them in history, haven't we? Like in the 50s, like divorce wasn't really a thing in church, was it? Now it happens quite a bit, you know? And maybe in the, like, 80s, you know, living with each other before marriage didn't happen that much. But now... Like, I work in a college in Brisbane, and I would say that five out of ten of the Christian couples that I have pastoral care with are sleeping together. And so, like, you think about that, you're like, okay, well, that would have been scandalous 20 years ago, but what happens is that when culture dictates where biblical truth is, is that eventually we slide yeah. towards what culture says. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean we've got a license to go around belittling or picking or judging, because we know what's coming in chapter 2, verse 1. But it also means that we've got to be conscious that this is the nature of human beings. This is what we do when we're given over. We just do whatever we want. It's in the end of Judges. There's a time in Israel's history where there's no judge. And it says that there was no king, no judge in Israel. And each person did what was right in their own eyes. And we get to a place of subjective morality. Where, okay, you do whatever you want and that's sweet for you as long as you don't judge what I want to do. Okay, and, and in our culture, one of the worst social sins you can commit is have objective truth, or at least claim you do. Say that your truth is superior to somebody else's. And so what Paul's doing here is, is as Ben said, reminding everyone that we start cooked. And so instead of like going, okay, this person's worse than that person, or I'm better than that guy, and maybe you're set free from this, but I think it's wired in a lot of us to think this way. Paul goes on to say in verse 28, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so they did not do what ought to be done, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of evil, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. How many sermons have you heard about the greedy Christian? Oh, you greedy guys. Hey? It's in the same list. What about the malicious? Those who like plot against one another. Where's the social outcry against the Christian greedy guy? Do you know what I mean? How many times do we go and knock on people's doors? Guys, you've got to help. The, the world's getting greedy up and you need to vote against greed. <laughs> help us stand against greed. Because in Christianity, we come in and, oh, he's pretty greedy. Hopefully he tithes, got lots of money. <laughs> but he's greedy, right? But, it, okay, okay, well, I'm still none of them. Passage goes on. They are gossips. Yeah. Uh, right? Those who talk behind one another's back, not to the person. You know you're a gossip when you've got something to say to somebody, you say it to somebody else. Anyone else feeling like, oh no, my finger pointing is finger pointing back at me. Right? The gossips, slanderers. Have you ever talked, like tainted somebody's name behind their back? Have you ever said, oh, he's a nice guy, but she's lovely, but I mean, slanderer. God haters. Insolent, arrogant. Men, we ever been there? Ladies, we ever been there? Arrogant? Yeah. Superiority? I'm better than that guy. You know, I'm not beating him. It's entwined in us from a very young age, isn't it? I beat them in the running race, so therefore I am better. Yeah. You know, it is there, it's just waiting there to come alive. Boastful. Oh, there were a few head scratches there. The head scratches were like, oh, I don't want to I'm going to confess, but I'm not put my hand up. Boastful, right? Look at me living on the coast of my epic place. No, 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 the Lord's blessed me. It's okay. I just use it as a vessel for him. But I just bring it up all the time. Do you know what I mean? We can be boastful in prayer. Lord, thank you so much that you've blessed me so much more than all these other people. Can I remind you of any prayers in the Bible? Right? You may think, why are you picking on me, Dave? Because I'm picking on everybody. That's the point of the passage. All of us are cooked and need uncooking. 
They invent new ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Kids, that puts you on the list. And guess what? Kids are still 50. You've still got parents. They're still around. Don't disobey them. Puts you on the list. Hey? Hey? Oh, he's our parent. Yeah, but that's not what I'm getting at right now, honey. Don't disobey your father. They've got no understanding. Oh, uh, no fidelity, no love. That's a big one, right? Like, I would love it if we had a bit more of a platform to be able to hit someone else. Man, you're not super loving right now. It's part of your redemption. No mercy. Though they know God's righteous decrees that those have, that those do such things deserve death, not only continue in these very things, but approve of them who practice it. So that's not just subjective morality, that's championing of subjective morality. So that's us taking the stance saying, well, I'm going to do whatever I want, and you do whatever you want, and I'm going to applaud every decision you make, no matter what barometer you're using as a moral framework. It's dangerous, right? If each one did what was right in their own eyes and we could all just make up our own moral framework, it would be chaos. I know that humanity would like to think that we'd all get along. I'm stealing all your wallets. Because if there's no moral framework, what's the point? If there's no moral kibar, if there's no moral code, there's no point. Okay? So then, after all that, you. Therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. There are literally only two categories of people. Those with Christ and those without. And those without, we ought to be praying, God, reveal yourself. Mm -hmm. Show yourself to them. Bring your presence into their life. Help me be a light bringing vessel, help me show them the light of God. Because they, if we can trust that the word of God's inspired, we can trust that, that God has revealed himself and that they've chosen and he's let them follow that. They've chosen to walk away and he's given them over, but it's not a permanent thing. We just need to be uncooked through the blood and body of Jesus Christ, which he has given for us. In an application of this, how do we know then if we're obeying this passage and passing judgment. Because then your pushback against me could be, well, then what do we do, Dave? How do we encourage people towards sanctification? Does that mean everyone can just do whatever they like? No, what we need to trust is that once someone's in Christ, that we steer them to the Holy Spirit and he takes them down the path of sanctification. The process of sanctification is a transaction with the human being and with God himself where he cleans them of the things that he needs to purge them off. Right? And sometimes that process is slower than we'd like to see, and sometimes it's quicker. When I became a Christian, I didn't get seen. So I was talking to a friend the other day. We both got became Christians in similar circumstances through addiction and party and a few other things. His got broken off instantly, and mine took like this two-year of groveling battle. And of oh, Maybe longer, ages, I don't know. And eventually, those things became things of the past. Yeah. Right? So what we've got to do is, this is how it works out in practice, is that your heart for anybody who struggles with any of these things when they become a Christian is to pray for them. Yeah. Is to walk with them yeah. and to be with them. Because the thing is, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, You've been activated to know what's right and wrong. You've been activated to obey your conscience and to, and to follow the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if he's working in your life, that's his responsibility. Our responsibility is to champion in those who have put their faith in Christ to keep persevering when it's tough, to keep standing when it's tough. Last year, I was teaching this beautiful girl in my Brisbane job. And she was 
in love with Jesus. And a lesbian. And she grew up like feeling like nobody wanted her. Because the gay community didn't want her because she was a Christian. Yeah. Christian community didn't want her because she's gay. Yeah. And she just lived this life of like tension. And it was hard for her. Now, unfortunately for her, she her first experience of Christians who found out that she was also a lesbian was a horrible experience. Now, when I meet somebody like that, my first inclination is not to start coming down on them. Because imagine being in a tension where you feel like that. Now, why do we have compassion for that tension, or at least should? But then the greedy guy comes in, and we should be petitioning God, set them free from greed. God, help us to be, you know, no longer slanderers or gossipers. Because it's all one thing. It's not hierarchical. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. If we got that whiteboard out and wrote everything on there that any person struggles with, it is the great leveler of humanity. We're all in it. And we can't do it from top to bottom because then it looks like a hierarchy and we can't do it from left to right because then it looks like someone worse. The only way to pop properly illustrate it is to write them all on something generically and just put a big circle around it and that circle represents Jesus. That's the gospel. Man, I look at that list and I don't struggle with homosexuality. Have you seen Jess? <laughs> right? That's not my struggle. You've got a red face, baby, or something. <laughs> but when I roll in and I feel angry and jealous, do you know that old mate's selling his house next door for $900,000? And he's going to get it. Because Chugan's gone cray cray, right? Anyone wants to buy a place? Do it in the 1982, because it's not going to happen. <laughs> right? That guy's going to have a million bucks in his bank account in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to be like, oh, you're jealous of that, right? Look at your debt mounting up. But like, isn't it easy to get, like, I don't know, a little boastful, you have a win? You know how you do the Christian wins as well? Like, you, you, you don't want to, like, brag about it, but then the person you want to brag to is walking past you, you raise your voice a little bit. And then I'll let him to Jesus. You know, like, man, we're corrupt. Yeah. But Jesus has come to uncorrupt. Oh, so you're on a journey, I'm on a journey. Yeah, I think that's all I've got to say today. Romans is tough. Yeah. Like, you've got to understand that it's going to, for this to land, you're going to need to. Can you let work that? Um, I stand at the door and I knock. If God comes home, I'm so scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is <laughs> Suffer that the little children won't come to me. <laughs> I love those kids, man. You know, Romans is tough. Where it's going to land is if you guys are doing your leg work outside of here. You know, we don't understand what's going on contextually from the Bible. You've got to go and do extra work for that. Well, why the Roman church was particularly talking about Sodom and Gomorrah was also because the first 14 out of the first 15 Roman emperors also practiced homosexuality. So it was a cultural thing. Now that's from David Pawson. I got that from him. Did anyone watch that video? I don't know where he got that. I don't know what his source document is for that. But if you know Pawson, he's not just pulling figures out of the, out of the um, air. So what became a spiritual issue was also a social issue. Then when you read this and you see an overemphasis on that compared to the rest, you can make sense of that, right? Because it's contextual. If it was written in our culture, I think the biggest section definitely would be Greek. Leisure, worship of self, wanting to retire at 50. Not that that inadvertently is a sin, but if the, if the desire is to check out and just do you for the rest of your life, then that's where it becomes our Western problem. Oh, so much going on in this book. A couple of disclaimers. One. I am not the authority on social issues, okay? When it comes to social issues and spiritual issues, 
I prefer to put my head in the sand. People in this room are gonna agree with me wholeheartedly today, disagree with me venomously. That, don't come and tell me about it. Not that I'm not up for the chat. It's actually your discussion to have with God where you sit on this. All social issues. Maybe ask yourself a question, why do I hate that and love that? Or tolerate that? Or why do I practice this and call that out in other people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is it about my heart that is deceived that, that makes me think, I'm okay to do this when that's not? Yeah. You know, it's got, it's got to land personally this week. Hey Travis, you're a teacher. Can you go stand at that whiteboard? I just know you've got your pen license if you're a teacher. I have to show you guys. Can you draw a circle in the middle with a cross in the middle? If it's it doesn't matter if it's a bit gross, you guys will oh, the other side's good? Sorry about that, um, everybody in the way. It wasn't planned, but I need to make this really clear. Oh look at Ben. Hey, Westy who can lift stuff as well. Oh, Westy, tuck a circle in the middle, about like an orange size, it, uh, yeah, and put the cross in there, and then three or so concentric circles outside of that, please. What your goal, what you need to figure out, this is what all Christians need to do, is need to figure out, okay, the gospel is central to everything. That is a gospel issue. Okay, so, and in my opinion, the only thing in the gospel is Jesus. Like that, okay, how you respond to Jesus, that we looked at it today by faith. You know, is it grace that you've been saved or works? You know, if it's by, because you can't be saved by works, it is by grace yeah. and faith that you're saved, and that's the gospel issue. What happens outside of that are what we then call social issues. They're not gospel issues. What you've got to be able to get peace with is how far your social issues can comfortably stand outside the gospel without it ruining your relationship with God. See, some of the things I've talked about today are social issues, some are gospel issues. Let me make a distinction here. So gospel issues, I mean, that is just pertaining to our relationship with Christ. Like, that's what unites us. That's why we can be the craziest group of random people who all come together united with one purpose, to glorify God. Social issues are things like, okay, well, what do we do about... Domestic violence, how close does that need to be to our gospel truth? What do we do about sexuality? What do we do about evangelism? What do we do about culture walking away from God? Right? And how close can that sit to our gospel issue without it encroaching on our relationship with God but still being something we consider valuable? This can be all kinds of things. Like, the Christians will have different perspectives of all kinds of things in different areas. So for me, the, whether or not the earth is X amount of years old or came to being that way or this way, actually for me, not a gospel issue. You've got to solve the origin of sin somewhere in there. But that's not going to stop, like anyone who differs on that is my brother. And I honestly won't spend more than five minutes talking about it. Too far that way or too far that way, you can have that. <laughs> right? Okay, but for other people, you're like, no, Dave, you must have a creation perspective in the gospel. See, do you understand? This is the freedom we have in Christ. Some of the issues today, particularly around sexuality, this might annoy you, but they're further out from the center than most evangelical pastors, particularly Baptist ones. For me, it comes down to pure time. I, I know that sounds like a cop-out, but I am not gonna be a social justice person when I can be a gospel person. Everyone's got X amount of hours. Everyone loses sleep over these stresses and whatever else. I'm not going to lose sleep over things that don't directly relate to the salvation of people in my work. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Where you need to find, like, the way we live this out. This is a thing. This isn't theoretical. This, you guys are going to go home, and you've got family members and loved ones and all kinds of people who are going to disagree with the gospel message. You're the one who has to figure out how to live in that tension. Mm -hmm. And it's not me. But if you've got the gospel in the middle, you're sweet. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so always think about that with all your social issues. Does anyone have any last final questions or statements? No, questions, questions, not statements. <laughs> we wrapped up, Jess, are we good? Yeah, and it talks later in Romans. No, no, come, yeah. and, come and say it. Look, to be honest, we, this is consuming a lot of our world. This 
one problem being married to another pastor is you do not not stop talking about Romans. So, like, <laughs> what have I missed anything? I, no, I don't think you've missed anything. What's important to David to grasp is that Paul is talking to this is we should not be surprised when we see sin in the world that looks like this because yeah. this is the natural state of us without Christ yeah. Yeah. and so we shouldn't be surprised by that in any way shape or form or shouldn't judge it in any way shape or form because these people are already living in judgment they need to be saved from that yeah. and so we need to respond to that wisely and lovingly yeah. And so also as people say from that, it's a challenge for us too to then go, okay, well, God has saved me from this. And later on in Romans, then it then discusses, well, now that I've been saved from this, how do I live with this tension, the fact that I'm still struggling with sin? Yeah. So we will cover that. And there are the questions that are brought up in chapter 3 where they're like, well, hang on, if you say that we're saved by grace... Does that mean anyone can just go do anything? What's the deal with that? And it actually does have that sort of back and forward. So you can read ahead if you like, but we are getting there. But we can't do everything all in one week. So today we're just sitting in this, and I think it's worthwhile sitting in this and just praying through this and bringing this to a place of prayer because the only way that someone really can be set free and acknowledge the truth of God is by having the work of God in their own heart and their own Mm -hmm. life. So... Calling us to prayer. Yeah, so sorry, not no, to no, no, question. I just feel like we needed to articulate just to fight together. So pray for us. Okay. Yeah. Lord God, we thank you so much that we have been saved. And not because we are so good, but because you are so good. And that none of us are worthy of salvation. None of us are worthy of coming into your presence. But for Jesus and I. Thank you, Lord God, for what you have done for us. And I pray that we will not take that for granted this week, that this will draw us to praise you in all circumstances, that it will bring us such joy that we will want to share your gospel with everyone, every area, every spectrum that we come across this week because the gospel is good news and we find freedom and love and joy and peace in you. Um, Bless this church this week, Lord God. Bless your church across the globe this week. And may your name just be lifted high in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.